My name is Yavor Bojino. Feel free to call me Yav. That's pretty much what everyone does. Uh, and I'm a professor here in the business school. I'm in the technology and operations management group. Uh, and in DQ, which you've heard a lot about today, I lead the data science and AI operations lab. So I basically look at how companies can more effectively operationalize uh, AI and data practices within their organization. Um, so today we've got an amazing panel and we've got three amazing participants. So I'm gonna sit down. Listen, I was saying it feels really weird to be in the like MBA classroom and to be sitting down because I'm so used to just roaming this room. Uh, but I guess for this panel, we'll be sitting down. Um, so the way we're gonna do this panel is I've got some questions, but then we'll from periodically you can just put your hand up and you can throw out questions. Uh, and then at the end, we'll definitely have some time for questions. Uh, this group of people is not shy about speaking, so if we do, if you don't ask questions, they'll keep speaking, and that's fine. Uh, but if you do have questions, uh, it will be great to get your participation. Uh, any questions before I introduce them? Yes. Yeah, sorry for the silly question, but on my app it says I'm supposed to be in experimentation with generative AI. Is that this? It says Aldridge 110. Yeah, so I think they uh, actually got the name of the uh, session. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so here's the fun thing. Operationalizing AI and Edward. So you just taking it off? You want me to leave it up? I, it's funny. So Edward is actually my so I mentioned the lab, the DQ lab. So Edward is my co-PI in that lab. So I guess that's how his name got on there. But he's right now on parental leave because his baby should have been born over the weekend. Uh, and I guess this is our way of sort of making sure he's a part of uh, the session. The session is on generative AI and experimentation. So if you want to talk about that, then stay here. Uh, and if you want to talk about Edward, we can meet after and I can tell you all the amazing things about him. Actually, you, you heard some of his research. So the stuff that Ethan was talking about in the morning, the BCG paper, he's one of the co-authors on it. So that's some of the research that my lab was uh, a part of contributing. So yes, thank you. I should, I didn't even read the title. Um, it's, good, it's good we're in the right room. Yeah, no, you can say that. <laughs> I, the three of you I know are supposed to be here, so. All right, so let me just start off uh, introducing uh, our three amazing panelists. So here we have Brian Bell, who's the CEO of Split. So Split is uh, one of the leaders in uh, providing software for experimentation and feature flagging. Uh, so for, I'm sure there may be some clients here, but for many companies, uh, they sort of use his services to run all of the experimentation within their organization and also all the feature flagging, which is basically the way the company, you can probably explain this better than me, but I'll give it a go. The way companies usually release software is by sort of hiding and behind these feature flags and then gives them simple on off uh, features. Okay. I think that was okay. That was right? Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Uh, so <laughs> on Zoom, we have Sumi Gupta, who unfortunately, uh, he, he is in Boston, but uh, he's joining us remotely today. Uh, and he was a principal data scientist of Microsoft up until like two weeks ago. Um, and he led a lot of the experimentation efforts. So most of, pretty much most of the different products that use experimentation at Microsoft, he was involved in that. And he's done a lot lately on experimentation at Microsoft with all of the co-pilot tools. So hopefully we'll be able to share some of that experience. And starting, I believe, on Monday, so yesterday, he joined the Gemini team at Google to again sort of continue that journey. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have Martin Tingley, who is the head of uh, the experimentation platform and analysis team at Netflix. Uh, so we heard a lot about Netflix and uh, strangely. strangely this yeah, morning, unexpected. unexpectedly. Uh, but today we'll hear a little bit from uh, Martin about some of the fun things that's happening uh, in experimentation at Netflix. Okay, so that's my intros. Uh, so I want to get started, and I'm just going to start with you know the most an important and high-level question, which is, why are we even talking about experimentation 
uh, in an AI and generative AI conference, right? So, you know, more broadly, what is the role of experimentation and measurement in the development of generative AI technology? So, Brian, maybe you could uh, kick us off in this question. Sure, yeah, yeah I, I think it is kind of the framing question. And um, I thought I'd start by just talking about, expert, just to level set, talking about experimentation and uh, feature management, which you also just spoke to, because, you know, the idea of experimentation is not new. In fact, I was at lunch with uh, one or two people that are actually here, and they were talking about how they have done experimentation in their own companies over the years. And it's proven that companies who really embrace experimentation and who use uh, experimentation have been able to get a competitive edge. And you know, Netflix and Microsoft and others are great examples of that. Facebook and LinkedIn, which is where the heritage of split software comes from, all really leaned in and built amazing platforms to ensure that as they rolled features out, content, software capabilities, they were testing them and almost viewing every feature as an experiment. And that created uh, immense value for companies. This is even before these intelligent applications um, became so popular because it allowed you to move more quickly without introducing risk. And that's the power of this idea of a, of a feature flag because you can put a, a little flag in the code and push code into production and then flip the switch and turn the feature on when you're ready. And if you're doing that with measurement and with data, you're essentially learning as you do that, right? So as you turn the feature on, you're getting data and you're understanding what happened as you rolled that feature out. You, you can understand it, it deliver the expected outcome, whether that's a business outcome, a performance outcome that you were hoping for. Uh, and that's immensely, immensely powerful. So experimentation gives any company control, risk mitigation, and then this insight that helps them make better decisions and optimize the capabilities you know, on their platforms. Um, with, with the rise of AI, uh, experimentation becomes even more important. And I think that's, you know, that's what this conversation is, is about. And I think that's becoming really clear. Uh, we did a, a survey uh, of development teams and asked them, is feature experimentation more or less important than before? And the, the response was you know, nearly 80% saying it's more important as you're building gen AI applications and intelligent applications. And why is that? I think, uh, one, just the need to go really fast remains and is even greater today, right? You have to move quickly, but you can introduce risk as you build these features. Uh, and so you need to have that control. And then secondly, you need to learn. You need to make sure that what you're building is actually delivering the value and doesn't have some negative impact on the business. Um, and with uh, Gen AI, you know, it's a bit of a black box and there are some inherent risks, right? Hallucinations and ethical issues and other things like that that you need to take note of and be sensitive to. And so the more control you can bring to the development process and the more measurement you bring into the development process, the better off uh, you'll be. And I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, we're having this conversation is because as you build these intelligent apps, you need to invest in measurement uh, as you progressively roll them out into the market. Yeah. Yep. And Martin, I'm just going to call on you because I know Netflix has been doing a lot with AI for many years. This is not something new for you guys. But what are you... What's your perspective on this, on sort of the role of experimentation in that development of AI and Gen AI? So, yeah, that's, it's a great point. Netflix has been leveraging AI models for, for decades. Some of you might remember the old Netflix prize. How, how can we sort of come up with better algorithms to, to recommend content for folks? And in building that cap those capabilities over the, honestly, the decades now at Netflix, experimentation plays a key role, right? Someone has an idea about how to improve a model. We test it on our members, and we really see which one of those model variants helps them connect to the content uh, that, that's really going to resonate for them. And so Gen AI is just the next step in my mind on that progression. And when I think about how we'll use experimentation, it all comes down fr from from my perspective, to like, what are you using this Gen AI model for? The Gen AI model is a tool. So when we think about evaluating these models, we should evaluate them based on what they're trying to achieve. Are they are they helping customers uh, <coughs> self serve in a help center? Are they helping them find content on Netflix? Are they helping them book book a vacation? And so we can really take it back to what the customer is trying to achieve and use those as sort of starting points for how we evaluate the models. Yeah, and. 
I'm just going to push both of you a little bit, uh, and I'm going off script as I promised. Uh, this is where things get fun. But one of the big challenges that I've heard a lot of companies struggle with is really uh, being able to show the ROI on a lot of these big investments in AI, in Gen AI. Could you speak a little bit about that? And here, let's just focus right now when you're sort of pushing uh, AI externally to your customers, and then in a moment we'll flip it around and think about when you're doing this for your employees. But I'd love to just get both your perspectives, and then somebody I'll bring you in in a moment to talk a little bit about sort of more of that internal view, which is, I know is a lot of your focus lately. Can I take that right? Sure, I, I can start. Yeah, I think. Uh, it is. I think the ROI is elusive, or maybe it's just not being uh, captured. I think right now there's so much excitement around building Gen AI apps that people jump in and and they just want to learn. And there's, I think you could argue there's uh, nothing wrong with that at this stage in, in the evolution of AI, right? That learning can be invaluable for any company. Um, but you do need to start to uh, measure it, and that's why you know what we're talking about is so important because. If you're not able to measure what you're building, there's a good chance you may have no impact, or worse, you could have a negative impact on the business with an, an unintended consequence, right? There's loads of examples about that where uh, you build uh, any application feature, but certainly a Gen AI uh, app feature, and it has some negative impact, right? Do you actually know when you roll out you know, the customer support chat uh, capability that it is improving customer service, right? Is it actually um, you know, reducing your support tickets? Which was was that was that even the intent of building that, or was it just to create a more a dynamic interaction? Um, and so you need, I think, as you're building these uh, applications, you need to think about what are the KPIs that you want to measure, and you need to think about that. You don't necessarily need to know the KPI up front, but you need to make sure you're architecting the feature and rolling it out in a way with a platform where you can pull data in so that you can start to measure what's happening, um, certainly measuring the, the KPIs that you care about, um, and, and also measuring any other metrics that you think are important to you, such as guardrail metrics that might be uh, related to performance, so that um, as you roll a new capability out, it doesn't have a negative impact. It might have a positive business impact, like maybe uh, it increases the dollar value of the shopping cart for a customer, but it might have a negative impact of maybe reducing um, or increasing your page load time, which mm -hmm. drives a, you know, a worse experience. So you need to really measure that. And, and likewise, to actually calculate the ROI, you need to understand the investment that you're putting into, yeah. into these tools. So. The, the one point I really want to stress, Brian, from what you said was this notion of risk mitigation. And we heard a lot this morning about the opportunities of Gen AI, folks talking about 30% efficiency gains, things, things like that. I think one of the big open questions right now is like, where, where is your business going to find those efficiency gains? And by thinking in, in the framework of experiments, we can act very quickly, we can try out a lot of ideas, we can protect ourselves against downside risk by measuring those KPIs and really learn rapidly about where the big opportunities are without exposing the company to a lot of risk. Yeah, and so I'd love to bring you in on this because here we were very much, sort of in those initial questions, we were very much focused on you deploying AI externally to your customers. And mm -hmm. so I know you've done a lot in that area, but I think one of the things that's been quite interesting about some of your work lately is thinking about more sort of internally how that is impacting uh, actual employees, and this could be, of course, at the time, it, you know, it would have been Microsoft's customers, but they're still employees that are using these tools to maybe improve their productivity. So I just, I would love to hear your perspective on, do, should we still be experimenting on our own employees? Uh, or, or do we need to have like a completely different paradigm when it comes to doing things around productivity for our, for our employees as opposed to our customers? Question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for accommodating me in this hybrid setting. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if you have mentioned I'm recovering from a mild case of COVID. So just to be sure and safe, I'm quarantining in outer space near Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the question here, um, should we experiment on co-pilot features for enterprise customers uh, where the end user is an employee. Um, 
to me, the answer even before Copilot or large language model features was yes. And a lot of companies, including Microsoft, do that today already. And um, as uh, Brian and Martin were alluding to, like with, with the advent of Gen AI, the uh, need for such experiments has just increased uh, dramatically. Uh, so a lot of things like we have to take care about for running a good experiment, we have to make sure that that, that is taken care of when we are looking at is it helping our enterprise customers or uh, employees? Like having a good hypothesis, for instance, is very critical so that we are we know we are measuring um, uh, a success uh, or we are testing a hypothesis that would ultimately show a success in terms of ROI, whether it's in productivity or cost reduction. Uh, it, it, it needs to be monitored while the experiment is running. So it needs to, we need to check for validity of the experiment as it's running. Uh, so we don't waste time if the experiment is not valid. And in the end, make sure we are interpreting the results correctly. Uh, when it comes to co-pilot features or large language model features, we really need to have the right set of metrics that we can use in terms of uh, framing what does success look like and what are the guardrails. So two big things in, in case of productivity would be like task success. Uh, are folks getting more things done faster with less effort? And then guardrail metrics, like are we being responsible in the use of this, uh, this new technology or, are, uh, or is there a lot of hallucination, mis, misinformed content that, that is being thrown out to our end users, which, which may end up hurting uh, our customers in the, in the short and the long run. Um, enterprise customers have a special set of requirements that makes experimentation more interesting in that space. For instance, uh, there might be some limitations on the experiment design. Um, in some enterprises, you may not be allowed to uh, split customers, uh, one employee into treatment, another into control. So you'll, you'll have to probably put the entire enterprise into either treatment or control. Um, in there might be some additional privacy or compliance requirements about how you handle that data. So you might have to use additional like uh, differentially private uh, techniques to get the signal without um, compromising on the privacy and compliance requirements for your enterprise customers. Um, but for sure, we need to uh, experiment and test whether we are delivering value to our enterprise customers in order to um, succeed in the space. Sorry, I want to double click on one thing you said. And, and just for folks in the room, uh, Sorry, mentioned differential privacy, which may be a term that some of you may not have heard of. So I just quickly want to explain that it's basically sort of mathematical guarantees on individual privacies. This is uh, something that's really taken off over the past few years as we have more regulation around data and data sharing. Uh, and this, these are a set of tools that ensure that you can't identify sort of an individual from a particular data set. Uh, this was famously used in the 2020 census, was sort of the first large use of differential privacy. And you may find that your company is actually already doing something in that space as a term that I think it's gonna more and more enter our vocabulary. But someone, I wanted to double click on, um, you, was, you mentioned sort of measuring responsibility uh, and sort of responsible AI and, and as, as guardrail metrics. Can you tell us a little bit more um, about what you mean by that and, and how we should think about uh, responsible AI and experimentation? Yeah, definitely. Um, to me, uh, it, it has to be tied to how, what is the end task end user task we are hoping our customers can accomplish with the use of these large language models or co-pilots and are we being responsible uh, in terms of enabling our customers to do those tasks better faster and uh, uh, in a more efficient manner um, things uh, for uh, most common use of 
large language model so far has been in like content creation. So um, there you can think about, I, I decompose it in three ways. Uh, first is like, what is the, the information that is being presented to the customer? Second is like, what is the presentation of that information? And third is like, what is the action we are uh, implicitly or explicitly asking the customer to take after that? So in terms of information, um, you want it to be grounded. And uh, if it's uh, based on some retrieved content that is being retrieved from say a database or enterprise uh, specific content, you want it to be grounded in that. Um, you want it to be accurate. So if, even if it's not grounded, you want to make sure that you're not, uh, like the model is not hallucinating. Um, you want it to be like non-toxic. You want it to be unbiased and robust. Um, in terms of presentation, you want it to be fluent, concise, um, and uh, well-structured so that uh, customers don't have to like look for the right answer in a, like a sea of like 50 different sentences. And then in terms of actionability, there should be, um, if there, if we have correctly inferred that this is a call, like a customer is asking for a help or a particular action, we we want to make sure we are enabling that right action if if that is the right thing to do. Um, so that it, it, the, the final content is actionable. A lot of these things um, have to be measured across the entire life cycle. Like some of these can be only measured in the offline setting where we know the golden golden truth for certain kind of uh, queries that we've seen in the past. But uh, uh, quite a few can be also measured in online setting. Like for instance, for um, in Azure OpenAI, there is a content filter on top of large language models that automatically kind of classifies whether uh, this content has uh, say um, anything that could be construed as uh, violent or sexually explicit and at what level. And um, based on it, e either the response could be truncated or uh, grayed out or not given out at all. So we, we need to measure those things. And uh, based on customers can set, um, if you are using Azure OpenAI directly, you can set those levels yourself. So even if you're giving out a response, you may still want to monitor like how often it is mildly say uh, hitting those filters even even though it's going through so you are you're aware about um, any issues uh, or anything that might be spiking other things i want to want to add is so these are like very specific to large language models but there's a whole responsibility didn't just start with large language models responsible experimentation has been and should be um, uh, sh has has been and should be a practice that we need to continue, and kind of reminds me of the the paper we you and I wrote in uh, our data science review, where we talked about like making sure we are measuring the right outcome, measuring the outcome in the long term because uh, it's easy to kind of do something wrong and see a metric spike in the short term, but in the long term, it would be harmful to the customers and the business. And also making sure we are measuring heterogeneous impact, like um, average might hide uh, harm to a certain uh, section of users, um, uh, which might be vulnerable to, to certain attacks. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, the long-term and short-term impact is really interesting here because if you're just looking at naively looking at sort of usage of large language models, it could look like, oh, this person is spending, they're sending so many messages. And that's a really good thing. But actually, it could also mean that the output is actually terrible. So they keep having to change their question and change and reframe, et cetera. So it's actually not doing a very, very good job. Um, yeah. I hear you talking about this in the when you're talking about data and customer decisions. Yes. I'm coming from a manufacturing environment. Yeah. So, you know, when we're using AI, we're moving heavy stuff. 
How do those, how would you suggest that I think about those rules in the physical world? Yeah. Ron, I'm going to throw that to you. Uh, you mean so you're uh, trying to apply a building? Are you are you creating AI uh, models for an industrial setting? Is yes. That, yeah. And um, and so who are the users? So you're you're looking. The, it's not a user that you're actually looking. Like how are you measuring success? And maybe that's your question, right? It sounds like in that environment. I'm I'm looking for I'm I'm looking for how to not cause physical harm. Yeah. First yeah. of all. Mm. You know, measuring a success is almost the easy part. Right. Sure. You know, I, if the if the crane all of a sudden goes left instead of right, or drops something in the wrong place, right. yeah, I'm right. in a, I'm in a bit of hurt. And yeah. maybe I can just reframe and and broaden that question a little bit, which is right now most of the things, except for what Summer was kind of saying, we've really been thinking about it this sort of B two C setting, right? Mm -hmm. Netflix, you have millions of, of uh, customers. So for you, experimentation right. with AI, you're doing it with many, many, many people. But Brian, I know you guys definitely have some companies yeah. that are B2B. So maybe you can just broaden that question and think yeah. a little bit about the role of experimentation in that B2B space yeah. and then how it applies to AI. Yeah, I mean, it's similar also to the employee question because yeah. in some companies at Microsoft, you have obviously a lot of employees, so you can start to run experiments on employee use, their efficacy and efficiency as they use AI models. I think in B2B, it might be comparable, right? The data set is smaller, um, and so the approaches you take maybe to measuring it might need to be different. I think the general idea, though, like in, in the example that you gave, you, you know, this idea of a guardrail metric, right? You, you might know, as you said, it might be easier to say, here's the outcome we're looking for, right? Maybe it's faster, uh, I don't know, output throughput per hour, but there are certain guardrail metrics we care about, right? Did, did uh, you know, was there some you know accident on the you know on the shop floor, or did did something unintended result from uh, the model that we created? And I think you have to think about what those metrics might be and ensure that you're tracking those as you as you do it. The other thing we've seen customers do that are smaller is qualitative surveys, right? It's not this quantitative heavy experimentation. I mean, even in my company, because we're not that large, when we use uh, experiment or start to use AI tools internally, you know, the qualitative feedback becomes important to validate, is this actually uh, driving the efficiency or the efficacy that we're looking for? So that could be another tool that you could use as you roll out these, these intelligent apps. I don't know if Mark, if you have anything to add. Or... The one thing that I would add is go, go all in. Have one AI propose actions for Ukraine, have another AI evaluate if they're going to be good actions or not, and, and see if you can, again, mitigate risk via a more holistic simulation of your environment. Yeah. And maybe that's actually a really good sort of transition. And by the way, I love that we're starting to get questions from the room. If you have questions, yeah, perfect. Oh, wanted me to interrupt. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do have a question, but just in the spirit of the room. Um, if you don't mind, um, yeah. I would say digital twins yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. would be, yeah. Um, but I really like the discussion about flags. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to understand something. Um, my background is software, so flags make sense. In this world, though, does it seem reasonable, um, since you have experience with this, to rather than flags, have dials mm -hmm. where you can crank up or crank down? features yeah. and then just have several features and based on users they run experiments crank them up crank them down and see which features meet various segmented areas yeah. of your users better yeah. so when you have a segment come in you know crank it up crank it down and does that seem like a reasonable yeah. thing to, I to mean, I can speak to as a practitioner you can probably speak yeah. better but absolutely i mean you can begin to Define the flag in multiple ways, right? You you can have multiple variants of one feature. It doesn't have to be an A B test. It could be many many features that you're testing, um, and you can start to do application configuration to also experiment more rapidly and iteratively. Yeah, would, would you? Add? It seems like S similar, right? Like what you're describing gets into almost per personalization more than experimentation. But I, I really see these as kind of members on the same spectrum. And I, I think from the Gen AI perspective, what gets really interesting is like 
the generation of new treatments that we could test on populations, mm -hmm. the marginal cost kind of is getting slammed down to zero. Yeah. So what you're thinking of is a dial where we have some algorithm with some number in it that we can tune from zero to one. Like we can get the Gen AI thing to make new UI variants for us, right? And so I think like my, my overarching thesis right now is that the world of Gen AI is going to result in a much higher throughput of experiments in a lot of situations because the cost of building the thing we want to test is going to go way down. And that means we're going to be more in the realm of optimization problems of let's dial that parameter around, let's dial it differently based on what we know about users and really get into like almost a mode of continuous learning yeah. where the product continuously evolves based on inputs that are generated by an AI system and evaluation on users and customers. Yeah, and this uh, is like such an important topic. Yeah, this, important. By the way, this is exactly when I said I'm going to take us somewhere. This is exactly where I was going to go. So it's almost as if you were part of the program. So I really appreciate that. But I want to go. There were a number of hands that showed up. Yes. Uh, I just want to pick up on that last comment yes. Mark, that you made because I was trying to connect Gen AI to experimentation over here, which is what the intersection yeah. here is. And I understand at one level you say, well, you can automate experiments. You know, which I think I understand. You can automate experiments and so on. But the Gen AI component to that, I was still not getting my head around. And am I hearing you say that you can tweak the experiments in real time and automate the tweaking of experiments with Gen AI? How does Gen AI overlay on to experimentation? And what changes with convention, traditional, you know, experimentation being around for a while? Okay, you can automate it. Are you saying the experiment will learn by itself and then start to automatically tweak the experiment based on the findings? Is there a feedback loop and you automate that? I'm just trying to connect that. So, so I'll, I'll answer, but then I'll, I'll yeah. send it over to the, the other panelists. I, I, I really think from the perspective of increasing innovation velocity, which I, I really think is the primary goal of many product organizations, the single biggest opportunity is to increase the throughput of experiments. And from my, my perspective, I'm a little bit agnostic as to how we do that, as long as we 100,000x the number of experiments we run. And so parameter optimization, it's a good idea. Uh, reducing the marginal cost of building the next thing we treat, great idea. And Gen AI can be used to come up with new variants. I, I think text is a great example. You have a piece of text somewhere on your product, maybe right <laughs> at the, the kind of... Um, Check out right before a customer is going to pay you money. You have some, some type of call to action. That's a text string. An LLM can make you 20 variants of that, right? And then it can start personalizing it. And it can keep updating. You can keep throwing in new variants to see how they perform. And your product almost evolves in real time based on feedback and the creation of new treatments. But Summit, Brian? Yeah, well, I was just going to add, I think that is... Uh, you know, content creation is becoming really cheap, right? Uh, content, it could be a feature, it could be text, it could be an email and marketing, right? You can use Gen AI to create all those variants, um, and, and, then, and then you need to run experiments on those. I, I do think eventually we will get to a world where the, the experiments themselves are automated, right? I was talking to uh, one of our customers in, in, in one of the largest banks in New York, and and you know his vision is you know we know he said on our mobile app our banking mobile app that if you're on the home page and you run certain messages on the home page on that on that front part of the mobile app uh, it has a material impact on that business and um, and and we're beginning to understand you know how to tweak and to get revenue for certain lines of business through the app based on how we expose it in the app. And his vision, which we align to, is how do you automate that? How do you just set a goal, which is I want to drive, I'll make it up, like $100 million worth of mortgage applications. I want to process $100 million of mortgage applications in the next three months. Can you run a set of experience, create a bunch of variants, whether it's content, maybe workflows in the mobile app, create all of those variants, and then automate the experimentation to optimize it so that you can, in the most expedient way, generate that $100 million worth of mortgage applications. And I think, I think that will be where we get to, this, where experimentation can be heavily automated and you're driving towards a certain business outcome. But, and, and again, to mitigate the risk, you're putting guardrail metrics all around it to ensure you don't do anything you know, stupid as you drive towards that business goal. So anything you want to add? And then I'll, I want to just do a push question to them. Yeah. I think a lot has been said in the space. I'll, I'll 
the part maybe I can I can focus on is there are multiple parts that you can change in the large language model application uh, as you're thinking about generating new experiences. Um, for instance, one would be the prompt for what you're trying to generate. You could be uh, you could you could try different prompts to see um, which one fits your use case better. Uh, second could be that you just get multiple variants from the same prompt and see which one you like. Third could be a parameter tuning where you're looking at like say temperature, how creative those are the large language models should be. And then uh, fourth is around uh, retrieval augmented generation. If you're trying to do some contextualization or personalization, you might have to retrieve context from uh, about that user from somewhere. So what are you retrieving? How, how well are you retrieving it? So what are you adding in that prompt space? So those would be, that's a very rich area where you can start to uh, explore. I don't know yet if we, uh, I, I do love the vision of making it automated. Mm -hmm. um, to begin with, I would love to have a human in the loop uh, so that uh, somebody is actually checking what we are exposing to the customers uh, before we actually do that and also check uh, on whether uh, the results are interpreted correctly. Are they posit really positive or mm. are the metrics moving in the right direction for the wrong reason? Yeah, and I think the one thing that's standing out to me, and this is kind of something what you were speaking about, which is if we're having all this content that's being generated and then we're using experimentation to figure out which of these content should be given to the majority of our customer, what happens to organizational learning in that model? Because right now, we sort of, we all learn from our experiences and then we use that to mm. think of what's the next thing that we should do. The way usually experimentation is plugged in is we'll run an experiment and then from there, we'd, maybe we're testing some hypothesis and then based on the results, we'll learn something. So so what is what does organizational learning look like in this model where content and you're running thousands and thousands of experiments and Martin, I'm going to throw this to you first. Sure. Uh, let me let me give two examples from from Netflix. If you, if you go to the Netflix app on, on your phone or your TV, you'll see a, a top 10 row. And so the top 10 row was a test we ran a few years ago. And, and ultimately, it was good for our members. But to, to kind of get that experience launched, we needed a new UI treatment. We needed some new data work behind the scenes to power it. It's, it's specific to, to each country, so there's a, a localization piece there. And for a test like that, there'll be a, a spec, there'll be a hypothesis. Before the test is run, it will get discussed in a room that looks a lot like this. And then the test will get run, and then a data scientist will write a long document that looks an awfully lot like an undergraduate lab report. <laughs> uh, and the results will be discussed in a room like this, and then someone will go make a decision. And so that's a very slow, slow pace of innovation. On the other end of the spectrum, if you, again, go to your Netflix app, every, every one of the tiles you see, the images, is personalized for you. And you can think that for every title, we run what looks a lot like an A-B test to figure out which images are working for that title and, and to your point, which ones work for you. So that's basically an A-B test that we run for every single title. And so at that level, we can't get in a room like this and talk about which image won for reindeer, reindeer games, right? It just doesn't work. So instead, we, we need to like elevate learning to the meta level. And so the type of analysis we do on artwork like that is, you know, what, what works well with faces? Should the face take up the whole image? Should, should there be more padding around it? Should we, should we have multiple characters in the frame or just one? Do, do action shots work better, romantic shots, et cetera? And so we still preserve that ability and focus on learning as a product organization, but we've just raised it to learning across many hundreds of tests at a time versus these deep dive discussions into single tests. And then you're aggregating learnings yeah. across all of those experiments that you're We writing. aggregate learnings yeah. across many experiments. We, we write, our data scientists now can, can write postdoctoral review papers instead of those undergraduate <laughs> lab reports. Yeah, and, and this is so interesting because it's completely flipping around what learning, what organization of learning actually looks like when you have an AI powered organization coupled with experimentation. It's a completely different beast to what you know traditional organizations are used to. Um, 
Any other thoughts or should we all No, but I like that I like that idea that the, because if you're running a lot of experiments, you won't be able to learn on everyone, but at the aggregate level, there's a lot of learning that can still be had. Right. And that probably requires some change management because like what, what I see at Netflix is that our practice around experimentation, the, the documents we produce, the meetings we have, our communication channels, they're kind of all optimized for a particular level of innovation and, and throughput of tests. And when we think about, say, radically increasing that, I think we, we need to not only change our tooling, but also change the practice around that and our communication mechanisms. I think the, the other thing to add on this is, I mean, Microsoft and Google and Netflix have huge amount of resources and data scientists that can do all this work. And we have uh, customers that don't, right? They don't really have, you might have one data scientist maybe just a product manager and a team of engineers. And so we're beginning to, in our own platform, provide, using AI, provide interpretation of data as a, as a service. So you can kind of click, you run an experiment, and then you click on a little widget that says, okay, this is how you can interpret it. Here's a summary of the findings. And we're beginning to actually experiment with our own experimentation on making recommendations, right, for the user, because they don't have the data scientists to interpret the experiment. And I think that's another dimension of this that will probably happen as you run more and more experiments. Yeah. Yeah. So this might have something to say, I don't know. I have a question. Okay. As far as you know, does HBS use AI at all in the selection process of its uh, fourth uh, floor's prospective students? That's a great question. You've got a huge database of alumni. Yeah. In which you ought to be able to derive certain uh, certain uh, conclusions. Yes. And so, if you're trying to optimize your donor base, I think there's probably go after those high value prospects. <laughs> and maybe you don't have quite as many women. <laughs> you thought of that? So. Very good question. <laughs> so we have a whole organization dedicated to the uh, reviewing of MBA applications that is overseen by the faculty, but they're usually not directly involved in it. So I, unfortunately, don't have any working knowledge of what we do for our recruitment. But these are really important questions. And, and I think this sort of kind of comes back to a lot of what you've been hearing about today, which is really about how every organization needs to be in the process of trying to reimagine itself and, and think through every single one of the processes. And, and as Martin was speaking, you know, he was saying, after the experiment, we write this document, and then other people are going to read this document. But I'm just thinking about why can we even write a document at this point? Because with Gen AI, you're going to just use your LLM to help you draft that document. No one's going to read that document. It's actually going to be your LLM that is going to then read that document and summarize it for you. So why are we still in this, like, and it's because we're used to, that's the process we're used to doing. But in reality, we have to start rethinking all of those processes. Well, I think also that um, the traditional approach to experimentation it can be overwhelming for companies that want to start to embrace experimentation and create a culture of experimentation. And, and I see that a lot, with, particularly with smaller organizations or companies that don't have this discipline, they don't have the, the, the skills or the resources, and they, they want to get going. And when they, when they take a, a traditional approach to experimentation, it can feel overwhelming. And so if there's a way to simplify it um, and automate it, I think it would accelerate the adoption of experimentation within a lot of organizations. I think this is a great way to go. It's something we've been poking at at Netflix for our internal experimentation capabilities. But the way I see it is we want we want folks who have a domain understanding of their spaces to run experiments. They, they shouldn't have to be experts in experiments. And so mm -hmm. what if you just ask the LLM, like, hey, I have these ideas. Help me structure it into an experiment. OK, launch the experiment. I say, OK. Mm -hmm. A week, a month later, I go to some UI and I see these esoteric plots that look kind of like TIE fighters from Star Wars. There are these things called p-values. It all feels very like 
uncomfortable if you're not an expert yeah. in this stuff. So what if there's just the, the three sparkly star icon, the universal icon for Gen AI, and you hit it, and it's, and it's just like, well, can you explain the results to me? OK, this is what happened in the test. You know, What should I do? So I, I view these LLM-based interactions as just another interface into the data behind experimentation that can broaden accessibility, and allow more folks to learn confidently and make decisions confidently based, based on EV tests. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, we're actually uh, meandering into the question I had here. Yeah. So we talked a lot about uh, organizations that come to the table with an experimentation-based mindset. Yes. A lot of clients I deal with um, aren't quite there yet, yeah. right? And, and we heard this morning, I think we all know, uh, the payoff for AI is sometime in the future, and you don't actually know what it is, right? So the ROI justification for entering into an experimentation-based framework and methodology is often quite difficult to justify. So as you guys are working with clients and you know internally yourselves, what are some of the things that you use or you know the way you might guide some folks to think about justifying moving towards an experimentation-based approach? I'm gonna throw this to Brian because okay. this is literally what Jenny spent the vast majority of your time doing. Well, I think um, first of all, I do think generally there is a growing awareness about the importance of experimentation. I think yeah. that is obviously true. In fact, it, but their ambition is ahead of the reality yes. of where they are. In fact, that same survey I mentioned, you know, where they said, you know, I think it was 74% said experimentation is going to be more important with Gen AI. But then they said only 44% of the teams actually had uh, a tool or a platform to enable them to do it. And so their ambition and desire to start to run experiments is greater than their investment in tools, but also in people and in processes to do it. Um, I think that is where we are today. And I think there's a whole industry maybe that's evolving to help companies get going and, and to create a culture of experimentation. I think we could have a whole conversation around what does it take to get going with experimentation. I think it starts with leadership. You know, many, many of the people here in this room to say, hey, we need to create a culture of experimentation. You need to be comfortable uh, letting, empowering people and letting them use data to make decisions. You know, this idea of having the most senior person in the room say, this is the answer, or, you know, this is what I want you to prove needs to go away, and you need to empower teams to uh, use data to make decisions and to move quickly. I think that's a really, really important uh, part of getting going with experimentation. There, there's this gr great quote from Linus Pauling, the Nobel Prize winner, if, if you want to have a good idea, have a lot of ideas. And A-B testing is a way to figure out which of those many ideas are good. And Maybe just to call on somebody, because I know you went through many parts yeah. of Microsoft that helped them get started with experimentation. So you probably faced a lot of that pushback and that transformation that we just heard about. Yeah, um, I want to say like the best strategy has been that has worked for us uh, was to meet the customers where they are. Uh, so for for some customers, they are where I think Martin was saying. Uh, they want to test a lot of ideas and see which one wins. So they already have a success criteria in mind and they are ready to experiment with lots of ideas. So like, that's what I call like the experimentation first culture. And that's great to have uh, and uh, very uh, fertile area for experimentation to, to build and grow. But then there are other organizations that have had a successful product development culture that didn't have experimentation to begin with. So they're, Generally, what has worked is like what I think of it as experimentation last uh, starting point where you're just doing a safe rollout. So we all we say is like, okay, we know uh, you've thought this feature through very well. Uh, we also know that you have these <laughs> guardrails that you care about a lot. How about we just put a flag in here so that you can measure these guardrails as you, as you roll these out. So then um, as as you get a foot in the door with the experimentation last starting point, we start to see that, okay, we find surprises that, hey, this very well thought out, well tested feature still ended up hurting some guardrails and then gradually work your way up the chain to experimentation first starting point. Yeah, the one other reaction, that the, the other, We've talked about this too. I think sometimes the term, and you guys probably disagree with this, experimentation in and of itself sounds overwhelming. And so we'll often talk to customers that are using, you know, feature flags, this idea of just 
beginning to put controls in the code. And, and, and we'll just say, you need to start measuring. You need to start measuring the content and the features that you're creating um, and start to monitor and measure the performance, which is really almost the same thing as running an experiment, right? Because if you're beginning to measure what's happening, you are in fact running an experiment versus what you've already done. But, and this is maybe psychological, but it, it somehow seems easier to think about the problem that way to some organizations, which is let's just start using data and measuring what's happening. Um, and, and then you kind of mature into this idea of, of experimentation. Yep. And maybe just to, uh, just real quick for Martin, because Netflix does have a culture of experimentation, how do you maintain that culture when you sort of bring in new people who may not be used to using experimentation the way that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. It, it's sort of part of onboarding at Netflix is to become more aware of experimentation as sort of a first class methodology for for making decisions. So we, we hire product managers who are comfortable with experimentation or are willing to learn. Uh, and engineers get exposed to experimentation very quickly. And it really is a company where if you don't bring data to a decision-making forum, someone's going to call you out on it, and it's not going to be a data scientist. And, and so it's so ingrained for us, which really is a privilege, and it's taken a, a lot of effort to get the company to that point, uh, right, right down to, to Reed Hastings, the founder, like teaching A-B testing to the whole company in, in videos he's put out. So again, that, that, that strong message right from the very top. Yeah, that sort of comes to what Brian was saying, which is, and this is not, I mean, this is just for transformations, right? Not just for experimentation, but also for your AI transformation. Unless you have that leadership support, you're not going anywhere. Uh, yes? Um, so I have two questions, and thank you so much for all the insights. Those are really great. Um, first, in, the, in this age of you know, AI and idea generation through chat GPTs, uh, where there's definitely not a lack of, ideas, right, mm. in volume. Mm. How do you go about deciding which experiments should go mm -hmm. in equation, taking into account value add, time, cost, right? Which comes first in these equations for some of the companies that you work at? You, as a practitioner, you might have a better answer to that one, actually, because you probably get lots of ideas that come to you. And you get to I'm going to give you two yeah. very different answers. Like. <laughs> First, the, the kind of official line is like that. That is a big job of product managers at Netflix. They they decide on which ideas get tested in, in which order. My my personal viewpoint, kind of from a role that that sort of spans across the whole company and thinks about experimentation more broadly, is test all of your cheapest ideas today. Right? You should never have a backlog of cheap ideas to test because not testing them is a is is opportunity cost. So just rank them, rank them not by the, how how confident you are they'll succeed, but how, how quickly you can test them and start there. Let me, in the interest of time, I want to do a couple of rapid fire questions. So maybe we'll get a couple more questions from the audience, and then maybe just one person will jump in with a quick okay. response, and then we'll try to get as many of you as possible. So let's yeah. So my question is, I think in this new age where the UI is becoming just a chat window, what KPIs do you actually measure? It's like when you do A-B testing in a website, they click on a button. It's slightly different from today's age where you might have a customer service chatbot and people don't submit customer tickets anymore, but are they feeling that this human, non-human experience, I don't even want to interact with anymore. Mm -hmm. And then now you're like measuring the wrong thing, which is customer service ticket is down, but actually your users don't like your brand anymore mm -hmm. because yeah. it feels less human. So how do we... How do companies avoid the risk of, I'm trying to measure everything, but just because I need a KPI, I'm just going to measure this thing, and I'm 99% successful, and I'm going to release this feature, when actually you need a lot more work to come up with those KPIs. So how, do, how can a company adapt to this new world? So can I throw this on you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you need to be as holistic in terms of measuring that overall evaluation criteria. like. For example, you gave, yes, if your chatbot is horrible, you might see fewer tickets, but uh, you should also see fewer people coming back to that chatbot or starting that chat session in the first place. So you have to be holistic in terms of like, hey, just because we introduced a chatbot doesn't mean that in treatment, we should have fewer customer queries to begin with. 
uh, than control. So we have to measure that and 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 then down the funnel, like how many of these actually ended up being a ticket that a human had to look at look at. So a lot of it would depend on the scenario, uh, where you're using this, how you expect it to help, and also looking at guardrails in terms of what are the things we should be worried about if they go down. In this case, that would be retention or initiation of those requests. Great. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. I'm, so I'm Senior Director of Product Innovation, uh, and we do a lot of experimentation, very well supported in that area. Our metrics look good. We operationalize the metrics, degrade, we have low adoption. How do you balance that where it, it works in the lab, uh, it's supported in the lab, but when you launch it out into the organization, you get different metrics or different uses, and uh, do you experience that at all? That's my favorite topic. <laughs> I know I'm not meant to be on the panel, you can it, but okay, <laughs> right? Like, okay, sorry guys, I don't you think I'll take this one. <laughs> Let me just like, no, but, <laughs> no, but 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 this this question is fundamentally about adoption. Which is when, and we've heard this several times today, when you build it, people won't actually come uh, when it comes to AI. Uh, and the 30 seconds answer to that is you have to think really hard about how do you build trust between your intended users, if they're your employees, uh, and the AI that you want them to use. Now, there's basically three levels of trust here. Uh, you have trust in the AI itself, which is, is it accurate, is it fair, is it interpretable, uh, et cetera. That's one layer, that's sort of the baseline, right? If you don't have an accurate AI, then let's just not even talk about it. But the second layer of trust, which people oftentimes forget, is do you trust the developers, i.e. the people that actually build that AI? Uh, do you believe that they have sort of your best intentions at heart? Are they just building this so they can automate you out of a job, right? If you think you're supposed to use this tool for the next six months and then you're going to get replaced by this tool, people are not going to want to use it. And then the third level of trust here is really trust in the processes of the organization, right? Uh, how do you handle disagreements, right? Right now, most of AI is co-pilot, so how do you handle disagreements between the person uh, and the AI? Um, so you need to have really clear guidelines and sort of explanation. So those are sort of the three levels of trust. And usually when there is a misalignment between what you saw in your lab, in your pilot study, and what you saw sort of to, when you sort of broadly push this out to your employees, it's usually there's a failure in one of those three trust buckets. So then your task is to figure out which of those levers have you sort of broken, and then how do you rebuild trust for those levers? And of course, the way you rebuild trust around the processes is very different to how you would rebuild trust in the AI itself, which is why it's really important to go and speak to these usually employees and understand what is sort of the challenge here. Um, but just looking at the time, we're basically out of time. I'm just gonna do one second summary of the conversation because this has been an amazing conversation. There's so many takeaways, but you know, I think the first point to take away is that experimentation and AI are really you know, integrated and really part of the same package. You really can't just develop AI unless you have that experimentation mindset around the measurement of it, but also the risk mitigation. Because as we scale this, the risks also scale, right? So we need to think really, really carefully about the risk uh, and the measurement and experimentation that come together. The second piece of this is, and, and we heard this from pretty much all three of you, uh, is, and we heard this all morning, the cost of idea generation, the cost of generating changes to UI and personalization has plummeted to basically zero. So now we have to use experimentation to make sure that we can personalize things and we can really give people the best possible version. That's sort of the second piece. The third piece is when you're developing Gen AI, you need that experimentation because as we sort of heard, you have to think about what is the ROI and, and how is that impacting the people who are using it. You have to think really hard about that measurement capability. And then the third piece, the fourth piece of it is really um, Gen AI is actually changing the practice of experimentation, providing guidance and understanding and deep dives and changing how we even learn as an organization. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for being a part of this and thank you to our amazing yeah, panelists. You. This was amazing. Thank you.
the main room so we don't get uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>